let's talk about the dystopias written by Vladimir Sorokin in the 2000s. In that time, Sorokin's style had strongly changed. He worked at this time on two big projects. First, the so-called Ice Trilogy, which very much resembled a fantasy novel set in the 20th century. And then a novel that later turned out to be also a trilogy. Uh, this was The Day of Aprichnik, uh, the collection of short stories The Sugar Kremlin, and the novel Telluria. It's difficult to tell about everything, and I will concentrate on the first of these works, the short novel The Day of the Aprichnik, which has the best chances of remaining in the history of Russian literature, as I believe at least. Uh, I recommend uh, you that you can read this in English translation, of course. This is probably one of the most expressive works of Sorokin, although it is difficult to speak of it as in innovative, in contrast to early uh, works by this writer. The Day of the Aprichnik was written in the year 2006. This is a prediction of the future of Russia on this occasion after 20 years. The novel's action takes place in the year 2027. The line of development that Sorokin continued and hyperbolized in this case is the isolation of Russia. This was already clearer to some extent in mid 2000s and became especially clearer after the conflict with Georgia, after the war with Georgia, when Russia had found itself in complete international isolation. It's curious that Sorokin's second collection in this trilogy, The Sugar Kremlin, came out exactly in just this period of time. In other words, Sorokin, to some extent, anticipated the development of the real political situation. Uh, the Day of the Aprichnik is about the alternative history of Russia. However, the fact uh, that it is an alternative, we understand only now, looking back in the past. Sorokin's, Sorokin paints a history in which there were three periods of great troubles in Russian history. He calls the first the Red Troubles, and by this we must understand, of course, Bolshevik rule, communist rule. The second trouble, uh, troubles are white, most likely the 1990s, and then the Great Troubles, which refers to the beginning of uh, 2000. Then the time of troubles comes to the end, because the Orthodox sovereign, the Emperor, Nikolai Platonovich comes to power and he declares that Russia has its own way of development and it is literally fenced off from the rest of the world. I quote, as his majesty says, law and order resurrects from the grey ashes. That's that holy Rus stands on and will always uh, stand on fence ourselves off from the foreign without and the demon within. And all Russia, indeed, fences itself off from the outside world in a literal sense, because along the entire gigantic uh, perimeter, perimeter of the border, uh, the Great Russian Wall is built, similar to the Great Wall of China. However, as we later will learn from the novel Telluria, from the next novel, this wall would not be completed because the project turned out to be too large scale. But at least on the border with Europe, this wall has already been erected and only oil and gas go through this wall from Russia and from Europe manufactured goods come back to Russia. That is Sorokin somewhat hyperbolized the real situation of Russia's dependence on oil and gas and on foreign export. Uh, then this idea of isolation deepens because it is assumed that Russian citizens will no longer get to cross the border. They voluntarily burn their travel passports on the Red Square in Moscow. And then in the contrary, quite medieval customs are established. The Moscow state, Muscovy, uh, before Peter the Great, 
as you know, was the country of people who were not allowed to go abroad. It was impossible to go abroad from there. Customs are established that resembles the era of Ivan the Terrible. This about all is the Aprichnina. That is the personal god subordinated to the sovereign, to the emperor, but simultaneously there are also Soviet features, because along with the Aprichnina there are several competing special services at work that allow the emperor to balance between different forces within his own apparatus. The Aprichniks have enormous power. Strictly speaking, they are not limited by law at all. On the one hand, they are needed to commit repressions. The novel begins with the scene where the Aprichnik Kamiaga, the main character and narrator of this novel, takes part in the ravaging of the boyard, a nobleman of ancient standing. The ravaging of the boyard is done in medieval ways, that is, the Aprichniks take his house by storm, kill him and entire, his entire family, and in the Middle Ages, indeed, there was a collective responsibility. That is, it was not only the guilty one who answered for the crime, but all his family and even his servants. On the other hand, behind this you can also see Stalinist purges, Stalinist repressions. Repressions here happen continuously, not interrupted for a single day. However, the Aprichniks are not only the repressive force, they perform a number of other functions. There is a certain economy in this country, says Sorokin. The economy is of para parasitic type. Apart from oil and gas, which is supplied to the West, there is also transit. Oil production has had long ago moved to China, but there is a huge 10-lane highway, which passes through the territory of all Russia, along with the goods which are sent from Russia to Western Europe. Naturally, in addition to state duties, direct bribes are also taken there. One of the scenes shows Kamiaga, the hero, um, going to the border with China in order to negotiate with Chinese businessmen about the transportation of goods. In this medieval realm, everything is sold and bought, just like in Yeltsin, Russia. For example, the repressions are going on, but they can in any case be reversed, because every case that a Prichnik start up costs a certain amount of money. You can pay one amount for a private person, another for a civil servant, and as a result this case will be terminated. Already by these examples it is clear that Sorokin delib deliberately, consciously combines in his text the signs of the most different epochs of Russian history. And indeed, if we look more closely from this point of view at the text of the day of the Aprichnik, we recognize many things that belong to different epochs. From ancient Russia, in addition to the Aprichnina, the entire medieval system of punishments is preserved here. Uh, not just the cruel ones, but public ones. For example, in this new Moscow, uh, new Moscow people are flogged in squares, publicly, publicly executed and punished with uh, batons, batons and whips. And on each square there are separately flogged for some kind of crime. Here, by the way, Sorokin does not miss the opportunity to settle schools with his literary opponents, with the critics. On one of the squares are flocked uh, solely riot writers, literary men and critics. Fisticuffs or an order of precedence, that is one of the features of middle evil consciousness, who sits above whom, and so on. The Aprichnik have a strict hierarchy. The main character Kamiaga sits the fourth to the left of the head of Aprichnina, whose name is naturally Father. And Kamiaga says he obtained this place by many labors. The Kremlin is whitewashed, and uh, in reality the Kremlin in the Middle Ages was indeed uh, white. Uh, and the golden royal eagles are restored of the tops of Kremlin towers. 
In the collection the sugar Kremlin on the children of the empire will be given in celebration in the new year a special treats, a special presents made of sugar in the form of the Kremlin. On the other hand, there are signs of the Soviet era. And this is not only repressions. Uh, this is, for example, an official choir concert, which is watched by the Aprichnik, because the special services must observe and give censorship sanctions uh, to the works of art. And the writer's word, which Sarokin describes in the novel, is of course the union of the Soviet writers and partly its post-Soviet successor. Since before us is a fantasy about the future, there are some technological ideas in this novel also, uh, uh, also presented. Here Sorokin also follows the path of approximation, that is, he takes some currents or um, then existing gadgets and inventions and brings them to the limit. In the year 2006, it was already clear that the computer monitors become thinner and thinner. And Sorokin thins them out completely. Instead of a computer monitor, he originates a hologram that simply hangs in the air. Or he introduced smart computer cloth that can be compressed, crumpled like plasticine by choice. Uh, there are robots uh, here, of course, who serve for uh, all people and so on. But the most interesting thing uh, here, perhaps, is the word making, uh, which Sorokin does with pleasure, because in an isolated, isolated society, a special puristic language should arise. Purism is a trend that fights foreign borrowings. borrowings. These tendencies, by the way, were active in the middle of uh, 2000s. They also periodically appear in our time. And Sorokin replaces modern concepts or modern words uh, by the descriptive expressions uh, with the help of, uh, made up with the help of ancient words. Uh, it turns out to be very expressive and funny. There are such names as news bubble instead of television, um, the Western world, or money changes in, instead of financiers, uh, scientists are called feather brains, doctors, healers, and so on. Uh, all these words are difficult to translate, of course. Sorokin's fantasy is boundless. Uh, it did not fit into the, this novel and splashes out, splashed out, as I said, in the next collection of short stories. And in the novel Telluria, this state disintegrates, this old Russian state, this new Moscow state disintegrates. And before us arises the eclectic assembly of the, uh, of the diverse states from the medieval kingdoms to modern democracies.